hello and welcome to the second episode of the spark podcast today we will be interviewing weatherhead's own dr casey newmeyer about brand partnerships influencers and more when it comes to social media platforms such as tiktok and twitter thank you for joining us all right so now we're going to be talking to dr newmeyer dr newmeyer would you like to say a few things about yourself sure uh so i'm casey newmeyer i have a phd in marketing I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Design and Innovation at the Weatherhead School of Management here at Case Western Reserve University. Um, I have a, a research background in branding and consumer insights. I like to look at the interface between the consumer and the firm and how um, firms can take you know, consumer and customer information and make better decisions that are good, not just for the firm, but consumers and society as a whole. All right. Um, and I'm just going to go in straight to the first question. How do companies determine which brands to really partner with? So you have two different sides to this coin. Um, one is a, you know, kind of a decision based on the capabilities of the firm. So a lot of times um, companies partner with different brands or firms just on a strategic level behind the scenes. So we call these strategic alliances where you might use the, the knowledge and skills and capabilities of one firm to help augment your product or service offerings, but it's really never presented to the consumer. It's just kind of an agreement behind the scenes. And then we have what is called brand alliances, which are when brands are intentionally partnering together and presented to the consumer. So you see some of these where, you know, you have Kentucky Fried Chicken, Taco Bell Pizza Hut, all in one location. You have Oreos in a Dairy Queen blizzard. You have um, Nike and Apple co-developing a shoe and a fitness chip to, to put that together and present it to the consumer. So these are times where there are, you know, business alliances where they're using those capabilities or functionality of the products, but then they're also intentionally putting them in front of the consumer and saying, the, we, these two companies are doing something together to make a better product for you. And a lot of times these are looked at in two different ways. So they're looked at from that functional perspective, does the, the, do the two products fit together in a complementary way that you can make an offering that is better when they're combined? Like certainly the Dairy Queen vanilla ice cream is way better when you combined it with Oreo cookie pieces, right? So that clearly is a functional uh, complementarity where they're working together and the, the whole is better than the individual pieces. Now, then there's also, though, just a brand image perspective. Do things fit together based on what we know and how we feel about these individual brands? So you, you, the brands have to kind of partner and look at each other and say, do our brand images fit? So Nike and Apple fit together because they're both, you know, kind of striving to make our world a better place, whether it's through fitness or through technology, that their brand images have similar ideas behind them. Whereas something like you would never see, you know, Jeep Wrangler partner with Louis Vuitton per se to come up with some Louis Vuitton Jeep Wrangler um, like we see Ford and Eddie Bauer, though, come together and create a car that is very functional because that is the, the image of Ford and Eddie Bauer are two very functional products, even though they're in very separate categories. So when, when you partner, you have to make sure that the brand images make sense together. Even if you're in very different product categories, do the images align um, whether you're partnering to make a new offering, whether you're a, a company and a brand and you want to, to sponsor a charitable cause or an event or a concert or a sporting event or whatever it may be, does your brand make sense in that context with the image of the other company, event, cause, whatever it may be, right? So there's lots of moving pieces when you come up with, with a partnership and will it work and make sense together? 
This is seemingly the way most brands would do things when they have a product. But as we look at social media and how it's evolved, we've noticed something interesting. Social media platforms aren't looking at getting into these typical partnerships. They're utilizing people on their platform, such as influencers, to bring traffic to the site. With now over 850 million monthly active users, TikTok has shown that it does this well. I was thinking about like while you were talking in terms of how these professional brands will partner with two companies together. And I was thinking since a bit of today's topic is about social media in particular. And then you think of influencer culture, which I'm not sure how well in depth you are with influencer culture, but I would see an influencer themselves as like an individual person, as a business, as the brand. And would you say that the this way of determining influencer partnerships is a very similar process to these corporate partnerships? It, it is. Um, so when you when a brand is deciding whether they want to support an influencer or, or not, they're using a lot of that same criteria. Does that influencer stand for? Is the image of that influencer? align with what our brand image is. Now, there's something unique here, though, that um, a lot of times brands will pay influencers to use and promote their products. However, sometimes influencers will promote and use a brand product without the brand's necessarily um, permission. So not that the influencer isn't doing anything wrong, but it wouldn't be considered a brand alliance because the brand may not have intentionally gone out to that influencer and said, let's do something together, or I'm going to pay you to, to advertise and promote my product for me. So sometimes the influencers just do that on their own. Like this is a product I like and I use and they put it out there. So there are some nuances with digital platforms and digital influencers that are different than a traditional brand alliance in the marketplace. You won't see something like a TikTok ex shoe collaboration coming anytime soon. But you will see companies such as Chipotle, with 1.3 million followers on TikTok, making posts about their food, filters, memes, and more. How have companies taken advantage or not of these social media platforms to reach younger audiences? I'm not sure that many companies are actually doing this well. I, I think there still is a heavy reliance on traditional media, on television commercials, on print media advertisements. There is use of you know, Facebook ads and Twitter feeds and videos on, on TikTok and photos on Instagram, but I'm not sure that they are devoting the time and energy needed to quickly pivot to this changing marketplace. And I mean, we've seen some companies kill it, NBA, Spike Ball, surprisingly, Chipotle, BMW, and more. But to get more adapted to this 2020 lifestyle and going forward, we're going to need to see more companies, or we probably will see more companies, pivot to this type of style that Chipotle has adapted. Putting videos from their own company, people using their company's product, and more. Me and my friends, we talked about this a few times, but I think there was like Wendy's, for instance, is like one of the few big brands. It's so funny how like fast food brands are some of like the bigger brands on Twitter, like having a feel. Wendy's is this. hilarious. <laughs> if you are not following <laughs> Wendy's on Twitter, you are missing out because whoever is running <laughs> that feed is a really funny, smart person because some of the jokes and the, the witty comeback that they have for other competing brands it is amazing. It's really, really funny. It's well done. It's very well done. I've definitely been thinking about all that a lot too, especially something like Twitter in particular. I think a lot of the younger people, like the, the going down to Gen Z, isn't even using Twitter as much anymore. I think that's what's really interesting is there's pockets of people who are using these apps, but it's not as widespread or they're maybe viewing it, but they're not actively writing on it. Like there's a very small portion of Twitter users who are actively posting on Twitter versus how many people are have accounts. There are different types of users on all of these digital platforms. In marketing, we tend to call them um, the, the highest engagement bucket called creators. So these are people that are actually going out there. They're the ones that are posting the, the, the Twitter 
um, posts, they're making the videos, they're putting the photos up, they're making the, the Facebook posts, the blog posts, whatever it is. So these creators are out there driving a lot of the content creation. And this is a very small portion of, of, of the number of users. So Marissa, you're right that there's all of these users, there's all of these signups, there's all of these accounts, but only a small percentage of people these creators are actually driving the content on these digital platforms. Then you have people that are in some ways the responders. So they might like something, they might comment on a post or a, a Twitter feed or a blog or a photo or a video or whatever is out there. So they'll, they'll review and respond and comment on it, but they're not making the initial post and then you have people that are just spectators. And this is really the largest bucket of people out there that they are out there, you know, kind of watching what's going on. They're listening and they're seeing and they're reading and they're watching all of these posts, but they're not engaging with them. Um, they're not, they might not even like them, you know, or, or hit the, the heart or the thumbs up or whatever it may be. They're just, um, I, I call myself a lurker, right? I go on these digital platforms and I, I watch and I listen and I don't really engage at all. I very rarely post things even about my family and my personal life and my kids. I just kind of like to watch and listen and I don't actually create content or even respond to content that's out there. I just kind of like to view it. So there are different types of users on all of these platforms. TikTok now has more than 2 billion downloads. With it on so many phones, it's important to think about the data collection occurring. Looking at TikTok's website, the list is long. They mention they collect the following. Registration information, profile information, user-generated content, payment information, phone and social network contacts, and survey information. Of course, with permission when you hit allow, okay to terms and agreements, and so forth. The interesting thing is they also collect from the following. If you choose to link social media, they will collect from there as well. They collect from third-party sources, other users from the platform, and other sources. I believe this is from public record and so forth. They also have a usage, device, and location information, as well as access to metadata and cookies. Now, this is a lot, but in the day and age of social media, how much is it compared to other social media platforms? TikTok has made it clear that all the information collected is not sold to third parties. But there has been worries from current President Donald Trump about TikTok's involvement with China, as it's owned by Chinese company ByteDance. According to USA Today, TikTok has made it clear that if the Chinese government tried to force the turnover of information, they would refuse to comply. Along with that, the data collected isn't stored in China, but in the US and Singapore. Now, back to the interview. Yeah, I definitely find that really interesting seeing, especially where I personally will fall into these different categories, depending on what platform. And I also think since you talk about brand relationships and consumer relationships a lot, in terms of the consumer attachment or to some extent even an addiction for many people through social media. And I think about my own reliance on some of these apps and how, how would I operate my life without them, even though I haven't even been on for that long. But also they rely on us as consumers. But then again, they like said they rely on the content creators, but they also rely on these lurkers to have the ads into. So overall, we were curious, how do you believe that this consumer attachment affects this brand relationship and the brand growth? And then especially the additional idea of data privacy and how people are becoming more wary of that. Well, let's maybe touch on the privacy issue first. I think in many ways, individuals are not sure, they don't exactly know what data many of these platforms are capturing and how they're using it. So when, you know, when we sign up to create a login for any of these platforms, whether it's TikTok or Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, you know, we have to give them our, our email address, our name, although we don't always necessarily need to use our real name. A lot of times to, to have um, dual authentication or something like that. You have to give them your phone number or a secondary email address. You fill out, um, you know, your age, your birthday, that kind of thing where maybe not your address, but 
the city or the state or the country that you live in. And then you have to check that box at the end that says and accept and agree to these terms and conditions. And we all click it because we all you know, want to be part of the community. And we don't necessarily know because who really reads that fine print, right? We don't know how they're going to use our data, what our data is going to be used for, you know, are they going to sell it? Are they going to keep it? Are they going to use it to show us particular ads? What exactly are they doing with the data? So in some ways, we don't really know. And from a, a legal standpoint, our current laws are not up to speed to handle all of the issues with our, our data privacy. And there are some places like California and Europe that are trying to catch up, but they're not there yet. The, the technology of these platforms exceeds the, the legal um, ramifications currently. So that's one piece of the puzzle. But then the attachment side is that we do, we know from um, neuroscience and cognitive psychology and different things that we do get positive feelings. We get positive responses in our brains from the use of these digital platforms, especially when if you are a creator and you post something out there and it's getting liked and shared and people are responding to it, that does give you a, a strong you know, emotional positive feeling when something like that is happening. So then we are attached to it, um, you know, from a, a, a psychological perspective. And then also though, it's part of our social network now that interacting with individuals through these platforms is part of how we engage with other humans. And whether you, you love it or you hate it, it is right now that's part of our life. Um, and, and especially with the pandemic, it's a necessary part of our life because we're not supposed to be engaging with our fellow um, humans in our social network in a personal in-person basis because of the global pandemic. And actually in some ways, for some people that really need that strong social connection, these digital platforms have been lifesavers to be able to communicate with your extended family, with your friends, with your network, um, with with in the comfort of your in safety of your own home. So, you know, there are definitely some benefits to these platforms as opposed to the downside where people do get kind of there are some individuals that can get sucked into these digital platforms as an almost as an alternative reality. And we see this um Unfortunately, in some ways with conspiracy theories and different groups and different followings that are having a negative impact on individuals' lives and it ends part of society. And we need to figure out that balance between this idea of privacy and data usage and also how to prevent and stop information from spreading and from people belonging to groups that are not necessarily the most ethical or truthful things um, around. So right now, we do not have the laws or potentially the technology to stay up to speed with that. We have to figure that out. And that's a big problem that we're facing in the short term, in the future, that we need to figure out how to make sure that these S digital platforms are used for a social in a social way that promotes you know good health well-being and truthfulness um, without invading individuals privacy and without um, providing such abundant misinformation as well so that was kind of a long roundabout answer, um, but there is, that's a big question and a lot going on there. I mean, I think um, it's, there were, those are, there were like great points in that because for instance, whenever, like, firstly, TikTok, I feel like became way more popular in the rise of this pandemic. A lot of social media apps did, I can see it in myself, I use, social media way way more than I did previously it's gotten to the point sometimes I look at my active time on my phone for like my apps and Instagram's on like four hours and I'm like 
what did I, what did right. I do for that amount of time? And it's so insane. But I think about before, maybe it was an hour or less. So I think that's so crazy that I've given all of my, inf- like so much of my information to platforms like Instagram. Um, people have given so much of their inf- information to platforms like TikTok and use this app for hours upon hours of a day. And we don't even know really how it's being used sometimes. We don't know exactly where it's going, like really what's happening. And it's so interesting how laws haven't really progressed and it's going to see how it's going to progress in the future because if they're not at where they need to be now, will it, do you think that maybe laws will fall behind more? What do you think? I I think they will eventually catch up, um, but it's going to take a while. I don't think that's something that's going to happen in the next couple of years unfortunately. Now, let's talk demographics for a bit. According to data on Omnicore Agency's website, 41% of TikTok users are aged between 16 and 24. Roughly 50% of TikTok's global audience is under the age of 34, with 28% being between 18 and 24. Um, Would you say that it's the younger generation who have had access to the internet all their lives, do you feel like they're more susceptible to just believing every single thing that is on social media and developing these social media cravings, especially during the pandemic? So in, in some ways, I think that's two different questions. So the, you know, the craving and the need and the use of these digital platforms, I think they are more heavily used by younger generations. Um, but the second part of that question is the, the belief question about just believing everything that comes across it. And, you know, I don't know if there's a lot of research on this, and this is just my gut reaction. So, I, you know, I haven't researched this or I haven't um, read a ton about it. But I actually am not sure that the younger generations are the ones that believe all of this stuff, because I think they are younger generations that have been um, around their whole, digital platforms have been around their whole lives. They're used to the fact that you shouldn't always believe stuff that's on the internet. Whereas older generations that grew up with traditional, you know, Dan Rather on the news for one hour in the evening, when things were put through there, they were truthful. It was just a, a 60 minutes of facts. And now it's hard, I think, for maybe some other generations to separate what is truly a quote unquote, like news, a factual news piece versus an opinion piece or just a conspiracy theory piece or some other fake, you know, he hate to use the word fake news, Um, but it is sometimes hard for individuals to tell those apart when they are used to growing up in a world where things that were put in front of them that were labeled as news were fact, because, you know, for a long time, the only way you got news was either in that hour newscast in the evening or in a printed paper. And the standards for things that appeared in that hour long 60 minute newscast or that got printed in a paper was very strict. The, you know, the, the journalistic style that was used there and that you had to make sure that your sources were verified and that they were legitimate and all of those things that appeared in traditional news. Some people, I think, having have a ha- do have a hard time teasing apart on the internet what is a verified news piece versus something that's made to look like a news piece that really is not. Um, and in some ways, I think younger generations inherently understand that, that all of this stuff put on the internet could be put out by anybody. And we, I think younger generations also understand that photos can be altered and things a lot easier than some maybe older generations do, that they don't, older generations don't necessarily understand how easy it is to alter photographs, text, things that are put out on the internet that can be completely altered and fake um, because that's not what they grew up with. 
but it, like I said, that's just my um, kind of hypothesis based on my understanding of the situation. That's not something that I've actually confirmed through peer reviewed research. Yeah, I've actually heard fairly similar like ideas in like my own research. Again, not peer reviewed journals, but just my own personal interest in it. And I think it comes a lot to the way that these social media platforms is marketed to these different groups and how, like when they are first joining these platforms, what they believe they are really joining. I think that's an interesting way. I go, again, going back to these like consumer brand relationship and how it aligns, like what you are expecting to get into when you are joining. And would you say that, that the way that these platforms are portraying themselves either gets in two sides to the generational divide or through the social media versus traditional divide, if this way the relationships are marketed is fairly different and that affects how people are believing what is on these sources? Um, you know, that's hard to say. That's kind of a compound of different things all rolled together as the different different types of individuals use different platforms. So is it is something inherent about the individual or is something inherent about the platform? Um, I think, it, I, I don't know, you know, to compare and contrast all of the different platforms, I don't necessarily know enough to say if some of the platforms try to prevent some of these altered things more so than others. Um, you know, like Twitter has been quicker to flag things as inaccurate or falsified faster than Facebook. Um, but then with some of the other platforms, you know, like things that get put out on Snapchat, they disappear. So, you know, unless somebody screenshots them and posts it again, it's, it's not up there for long enough to maybe cause um, tons of problems. So, so with that, I, I don't know. That's hard. It's hard to to tease those things apart. Also, building back onto this generational divide, would you say that the generational divide and the relationship to the platform, as someone who's a younger person, and their relationship to any like TikTok or Facebook, is a different inherent relationship than someone who's older, or would you say it's actually very similar? <sighs> You know, that's hard to say, too. And it could be not necessarily the generation itself, but just how the individual is using the, the platform. You know, is the person using the platform to just converse with their social network to share videos and photos and things that are of interest to them personally with people that are just their personal acquaintances. So in some ways that goes back to like the relationship with the platform and other individuals is how are you using it? Are you using it as a personal communication device or are you using it as a way to gather information about the broader society as a whole? You know, or is this how, is that platform how you're getting your news and your information about the world in general, or is it just a way for you to communicate with individuals that you actually know? Um, and I think that is not necessarily a generational thing. That's just more inherently about how one individual is using it compared to another. So kind of going off like these different divides and how our use of media has changed, and also how you've said like brands are kind of lagging behind in different trends and like creators are these new almost different class of people would you say we're seeing a movement towards rather than brands having the power and choosing like what they're able to provide instead putting on the creators like if they've been promoting a project even without a like sponsorship or whatever like brands are more likely to then go to them instead like Kind of relating back to TikTok, one bigger one you've seen nationwide is how Duncan and Charlie D'Amelio have collaborated to do this cold brew. But in this way, like she originally was the one who was showing off this product and then Duncan reached out. So are we seeing more of a trend towards this way where 
influencers and creators hold more of the branding power? I don't know if it would be considered branding power per se, but it definitely these the influencers and the creators have a better understanding of what the viewers on those platforms may like and desire and watch and engage with than some of the big corporations and the associated advertising agencies. In, in some ways, it's like, you know, the person on the ground knows um, knows the situation better than, you know, somebody in the home office, right? Because they're entrenched in that platform and using that platform and making a living from that platform. And they just are better at knowing what is going to resonate with their engaged audience than a corporation just trying to throw something out there and seeing if it sticks. And that concludes our episode of the Spark Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. And once again, thank you to Dr. Neumeyer for joining us. If you would like to follow us on social media platforms, we have an Instagram at spark.conversations. Thank you.